Now it's time to talk about the evolution and death of medium mass stars. In order to understand how these medium mass stars evolve, we need to first acknowledge the fact that these stars have chemically separate cores and shells. In a way, this kind of means what happens in the core stays in the core. So we can add that to our list of facts. What happens in the core of a medium mass star stays in the core of that star. This means that the helium produced in the core can't get out of the core, and the rest of the hydrogen in the star can't penetrate the core to get in and replenish its so-called fuel supply. That's what it means to have chemical separation, when the layers don't mix efficiently and are essentially separated. These medium mass stars are layered, they are not fully convective like the low mass stars. For comparison, let's remind ourselves of the internal structure of the low mass star and see how it changes as we begin looking at the internal structure of a medium mass star instead. In a medium mass star, this particular one being a one solar mass star very similar to the sun, we still have a core where thermonuclear fusion is taking place and a convection zone. But these two layers are separated by the radiative region, shown here in purple, that's sandwiched between them. In fact, this is identical to the exact structure of the internal layers of our sun. We have the core at the center, surrounded by the radiative region, which is in turn surrounded by the convection zone, before getting up to the surface of the star, its photosphere. A star whose core is chemically separate from the shells surrounding it implies that as hydrogen fuses into helium in the core, the newly formed helium remains in the core and has nowhere to go. Eventually, all of the hydrogen in the core fuses into helium, leaving behind a ball of helium in the core. Here we can see an animation of this concept. By zooming in on the core, we can see groups of four hydrogen nuclei fusing into helium atoms, eventually filling up the core with the newly produced helium. With that, the core has used up all of the available hydrogen that it had and has fused it all into helium, resulting in the helium ball core. At this point, the star has experienced hydrogen core exhaustion, where it has, for lack of a better word, exhausted its hydrogen fuel supply. With hydrogen core exhaustion, the core has used up all of the hydrogen fuel that it had for proton-proton fusion. The newly formed helium replaces the hydrogen as the hydrogen runs out, and the core becomes a ball of pure helium. The now all helium core, which is temporarily inactive and has no fusion occurring inside, is surrounded by a shell of dormant hydrogen. The rest of the stellar envelope, of hydrogen mostly, continues to exist as is. Now that thermonuclear fusion is paused in the core, there is no radiation pressure pushing outwards to hold up against the outer layers of the star and its weight. With that, hydrostatic equilibrium is lost. As gravity takes over, the star begins to collapse. This collapse causes the star to increase in temperature everywhere, in every layer. When the shell reaches temperatures above 10 million Kelvin, the temperature that's necessary for kickstarting the proton-proton chain of hydrogen fusion, hydrogen fusion picks up again. But this time, it's happening in the region surrounding the core. At this point in time, the star has hydrogen shell fusion surrounding a dormant helium core. The shell may appear thinner than the core, but it actually contains a larger volume of hydrogen. Recall, of course, that the core is mostly helium now anyway. There is more hydrogen in the shell than there is in the core. With thermonuclear fusion, particularly the proton-proton chain, started up again in the shell, more energy is being generated in the star than before. With more energy being produced, the star becomes much more luminous and much larger. As the heated gases surrounding this hydrogen shell expand, the star itself begins expanding too and grows larger. As the gases expand, they cool down in temperature. Cooler temperatures mean a redder color, so the star is now considered a red giant. If we were to plot the physical changes in the star as it evolves, we can see that the star begins to move off the main sequence just after hydrogen core exhaustion occurs. As it cools down, we can see the star move to the right on the HR diagram towards cooler temperatures. As it becomes brighter, it moves up the HR diagram towards brighter luminosities. 
resulting in the creation of the red giant branch of the HR diagram. In fact, our own sun is destined to become a red giant in its future. At its largest, the physical size of the sun will be just about the size of Earth's own orbit, but it will have lost about 10 to 20 percent of its original mass by this point in its evolution. Now, as fusion in the hydrogen shell continues, the temperature in the star's core continues to rise too. Eventually, it reaches the perfect temperature necessary, 100 million Kelvin, for helium to begin fusing in the core as well. However, depending on the mass of the star, the helium either ignites gradually or explosively. But how exactly does helium fuse into heavier elements? To understand helium fusion, we must learn about the triple alpha process. Just as the proton-proton chain was the specific type of the thermonuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium, the triple alpha process is the specific reaction that fuses helium with other helium nuclei to create heavier elements like carbon. At these higher temperatures, helium fuses into carbon via the triple alpha process. Now, you might be wondering why it's called the triple alpha process instead of something like helium to carbon reaction chain cycle thing. But the reason is that an alpha particle is a particle consisting of two protons and two neutrons, making it essentially identical to the helium nucleus itself. So let's dive into the triple alpha process and see what it's all about. We start with two helium nuclei, or alpha particles, that come together to fuse into a beryllium nucleus. Almost immediately afterwards, about a billionth of a second later, this beryllium nucleus fuses with a third alpha particle to form carbon. Both steps of this reaction emit energy as gamma ray photons, just like the proton-proton chain did before. The triple alpha process results in the creation of light too. So now the red giant star has different types of fusion taking place in different regions within it. There is helium fusion in the core via the triple alpha process where the temperature is 100 million Kelvin and carbon is being created. And there's hydrogen fusion in the shell surrounding the core where the temperature is 10 million Kelvin and more helium is being created. With so much fusion, more than before, lots of energy is being produced, making the star very bright. If we were to graph the star's luminosity against its age, in other words, see how bright the star is at different stages of its life, we would see a graph looking something like this. This is specifically the luminosity of our sun as it's speculated to change over time as the sun evolves. Right now, we can set the luminosity of the sun to 1. This makes the rest of our comparisons a little bit easier to understand. The vertical line at the left end of the graph shows the sun was much more luminous as a protostar and it became dimmer as it contracted into a main sequence star. If we look at the gradually inclining region of the graph, we'll see that the sun is expected to grow slightly more luminous as it ages over the next 5 or 6 billion years, continuing to fuse hydrogen in its core as it grows older. When it finally leaves the main sequence after hydrogen core exhaustion, there will be a sudden spike in the sun's luminosity as it enters the red giant phase, now that it's fusing larger volumes of hydrogen in the shell surrounding the core. Once the helium in the core ignites with the helium flash, which can be over a thousand times more luminous than the sun is today, and the triple alpha process kicks in, the luminosity drops a little bit, but it's still around 100 times more luminous than today's sun. Now let's briefly go back to the triple alpha process. What happens if we just bring in another alpha particle into the equation and combine it with the carbon that was initially produced from the first round? Well, fusing that carbon with the new alpha particle results in the formation of a new element, oxygen. And this step also emits yet another gamma ray photon. And with that, we can now account for the formation of at least four, if not five, of the elements on the periodic table. Hydrogen, well, hydrogen was formed in the Big Bang, sure, but it's used to form helium through the fusion of hydrogen nuclei. And the fusion of helium nuclei results in the creation of carbon and oxygen, and sometimes beryllium as a mid-product in the process.